5G and the History of Cellular Networks There is a conspiracy theory floating around and being circulated by people who should know better that 5G causes insert ailment here. Some people take this conspiracy so far as to blame 5G for COVID-19 or the coronavirus. We need to talk a bit about RF history here. I've been interested in radio frequencies and technology for most of my life, both personally and professionally. When I was a teenager, I became interested in radio scanners and found the radio spectrum fascinating in terms of all the information that was literally in the air around us and the different behavior of different frequency bands. Using my scanner, I could pick up all kinds of signals from police, fire, corporate radio systems, security, and even cordless phones and cellular phones, not that I did so. This led to obtaining my amateur radio license in 1996. As an amateur ham radio operator, I learned to use VHF and UHF repeaters, direction finding, and volunteered with the County Emergency Management Agency, and I participated in exercises as well as real events such as missing person searches. Before I had a cell phone, I used AutoPatch, which used amateur radio repeaters to patch an amateur radio to the telephone system to make phone calls. At the time, cellular telephones existed and operated on the AMPS or Advanced Mobile Phone System Network in the frequency ranges of 824 to 849 MHz and 869 to 894 MHz. This is what was later called 1G, or first-generation cellular phone systems. These were analog systems, like most radio systems of the day, that used up to 3 watts and had fairly good penetration of buildings and foliage at those frequencies up to about 15 miles. In order for the system to work, cellular radios were installed on top of radio towers to provide coverage to certain areas, and the system was sophisticated enough to hand off your call to the next radio when you drove from one cell to another. Still, in those days, dropped calls were frequent as the signals weakened at greater distances near the edges of the cells. Two frequencies were used, one for each party of the conversation. These were known as channel pairs and allowed for full duplex communication. In other words, both parties could speak at the same time like a traditional telephone. This was just enough bandwidth to provide frequencies for two carriers per market, with each carrier receiving 21 control channels to control which phones use which frequencies and for cellular radios to communicate with one another to coordinate handoffs, and 395 voice channel pairs. This means that no more than 395 simultaneous calls were possible per carrier in a given cell. During the early days of cellular phone systems, when few people had cell phones, this wasn't a huge issue, but in time, that would change. The next iteration of cellular technology, or 2G, second generation, was the conversion of amps to D-amps, or digital amps, which utilizes TDMA, which stands for Time Division Multiple Access. PDC, IDEN, and PHS are other examples of TDMA systems. GSM is a system that combines TDMA with frequency hopping and wideband transmission to minimize interference. In a TDMA system, which is digital and not analog, frequencies can be shared among multiple simultaneous calls by sending voice data in rapid succession, thereby allowing more calls to be handled and also required less power in a cell phone. Since 2G is digital, it also allowed the use of SMS and MMS messages. GPRS was also used on these networks to allow other data, such as emails, to be sent across the network, albeit with limited bandwidth. As the FCC allocated additional frequency bands, such as 1900 MHz, these were utilized as well. At higher frequencies, more bandwidth is available for calls and data, but it's harder to penetrate objects such as walls, trees, and even air, so range is limited the higher in frequency that you go. 2G systems provided up to 64 kilobits per second of bandwidth. 3G, or the third generation, added additional radio spectrum, primarily around 2.1 GHz, which provided for greater bandwidth, but again with the caveat that it has poorer penetration than lower frequencies. CDMA, or Code Division Multiple Access, came along around this time, even though some late 2G systems, which work similarly to TDMA, but uses spread spectrum technology, thus spreading out the communications over multiple frequencies, which can be a bit more secure. 3G can transfer data as fast as 2 megabits per second. 4G utilizes more frequency bands, including those around 600 MHz, 700 MHz, 1.7 GHz, 2.3 GHz, and 2.5 GHz. The lower frequencies added to 4G provide much better penetration, but have limited bandwidth. There have been multiple iterations of 4G, including some called LTE, or long-term evolution, which is essentially an improvement within the same generation of technology. The allocation of higher frequencies provide the much higher data transmission capacity. 4G can reach 100 megabits and higher in certain circumstances. 
5G adds even more frequency bands, this time including some as high as 28 GHz and 39 GHz. If you've been paying attention so far, you know that at frequencies that high, you can't penetrate much at all, certainly nothing with water in it like skin or trees or foliage. This is why most of the 5G systems have massive data transmission capabilities, as high as 10 gigabits per second in close range, but even at several hundred feet away, lose bandwidth rapidly. The exception is T-Mobile, which utilizes 600 megahertz for much of their 5G system, meaning they will have good range, but far less bandwidth. Back in 2004, I was an engineer for a wireless internet service provider. We provided high-speed wireless internet access to clients out to a range of 50 miles from our transceiver using licensed MMDS spectrum that operated at 2.5 gigahertz. The problem with this frequency range is we had to use directional antennas and line of sight for the system to work. Any trees or hills in the way would interfere with that signal. Even rain would cause attenuation of the signal to varying degrees. I lived in an area, along with hundreds of potential clients, within our coverage area, but permeated with trees, so there was no good way to provide our desperately needed high-speed internet service to that area with our existing MMDS system. So I engineered another system, whereby we provided bandwidth to a radio tower in the area via our MMDS system, and then retransmitted it over another system made by Airspan, an Israeli company, which operated on the license-free 900 MHz spectrum using frequency hopping spread spectrum, similar to GSM mentioned above. The lower 900 MHz spectrum, even though it operated on considerably less power, was able to penetrate trees and other foliage much better than the MMDS system, and we were able to provide high-speed internet via this system to hundreds of new clients. There are a number of conspiracy theories running rampant about 5G. None of them I have heard have any basis in reality. As we have seen, while the higher frequencies used by 5G allow significantly higher bandwidth, which makes it valuable for a number of technologies such as video, it requires smaller cells and many more transceivers to provide usable coverage from that system. 5G at millimeter wave frequencies penetrate matter and even air very poorly. With this knowledge, you should know right off the bat that most of the conspiracy theories are inherently impossible because the signal cannot even penetrate your skin unless the transmitter is using extremely high power and you're within feet of it. An example of such high power and proximity is a microwave oven, which operates at around 2.45 gigahertz and uses massive amounts of power in a Faraday cage of around 1,000 watts or more to have enough power to vibrate molecules and warm up your food. As all RF engineers and technicians know, the same can happen to human tissue, so you don't want to be right next to an antenna putting out high power or you could sustain skin burns or damage to your eyes, but that's the worst it can do. All radio frequency energy is non-ionizing radiation, meaning that it has insufficient energy to break chemical bonds or remove electrons, so it cannot damage DNA or RNA. Ionizing radiation, which only exists on the other side of visible light and ultraviolet in the spectrum, such as X-rays and gamma rays, have the energy to do this. Ionizing radiation starts at 30 petahertz. One petahertz is one million gigahertz. So radio frequency energy in the megahertz and gigahertz area that we're talking about for 5G is nowhere even remotely close to the frequencies required to generate ionizing radiation. Note that Wi-Fi operates on frequencies very similar to your microwave oven, but Wi-Fi uses no more than 100 milliwatts, or a thousand times less power than your microwave oven. You can sit next to your Wi-Fi transceiver for your entire life with no ill effects. Some conspiracy theories say 5G is the same as the systems used by the military to drive people away from areas. Obviously, this is not the case. What good would it do to spend millions of dollars to deploy a system that will drive your customers away? Active denial systems used by the military operate around 95 gigahertz and use up to 100 kilowatts of power to heat the surface of the skin on a human consistent with what we have discussed here. Think of a giant heat light being pointed at you, which makes you want to get out of that area. Even at that massive power level, these systems can only penetrate the skin by about 1 64th of an inch. Some have said that 5G is causing the COVID-19 coronavirus. I don't really know where to start there other than to say that that makes no sense whatsoever. Viruses spread through physical contact. 5G radio waves do not have the ability to penetrate your skin, much less create biological entities. COVID-19 is spreading rapidly in areas where 5G has never been deployed. Quarantine and hygiene procedures would be ineffective if COVID-19 were spread through radio waves. Some have said that radar caused the Spanish flu in 1918, despite the fact that radar wasn't deployed until 1939. 
Some have said that 5G makes oxygen molecules oscillate and alters the orbital properties of oxygen molecules, thus depriving humans of oxygen and causing asphyxiation. Aside from the obvious fact that killing your customers is not a very good business strategy, this can be easily disproven by sitting in a room with a 5G device and monitoring your own oxygen saturation levels. Some claim that 5G is responsible for DNA mutations, mitochondrial damage, cancer, heart palpitations, memory and cognitive problems, sperm changes and infertility, headaches, tinnitus, ADHD, anxiety, depression, heart disease, diabetes, and just about any other ailment you can think of while offering zero evidence to support their claims. Some make the bizarre claim that the Schumann resonance signals are interrupted by millimeter wave RF energy. Schumann resonance signals are simply ELF frequencies that bounce between the ground and the ionosphere, just like HF signals that amateur radio operators use all the time to talk to one another around the world. These frequencies are nowhere near millimeter wave frequencies used by 5G systems. Some claim that the frequencies affect the body's ability to produce vitamin D. Vitamin D is produced by the body as a result of exposure to sunlight or ultraviolet rays, and it can also be ingested. UV light energy is completely unaffected by the frequencies used by 5G. These are just a few of the absolutely ridiculous claims I've heard regarding 5G technology and the frequencies on which they operate. I hope this provides you with the background to refute these claims as absurd on their face. 5G is nothing more than the next iteration of cellular technology that will provide more bandwidth to an increasingly bandwidth-hungry world. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe, and let me know in the comments below if you agree or disagree.